What's up everybody and welcome to this month's Patreon pick video. So if you guys are not familiar, this is the third or the fourth time that I've done this. It's a new perk that I've been trying this year to where every single month I let my patrons give me suggestions for a video. They're very fond of rankings and top tens thus far. And then the top ones are the ones that I enjoy the most. I put into a poll, let them decide for the month which video I should do that is totally sponsored and originated by them. And this month, it is top 10 good movies with bad endings. A very interesting topic. I actually, before I started doing YouTube, I had a podcast that I did for a couple of months the summer before I started, and this was one of my top five ideas that I did that were, if you wanna go back into the, the relics of the Cody Leach era, there's actually an audio version of this top five good movies with bad endings. I remember when I was in the theater, I was like, it's one of those endings where you see it and you're like, really, that's it? That's all that we built up to. Some of those are gonna make it onto this list for sure, but it's an updated list. Uh, obviously it's five more, so it's gonna be a little bit more expansive, but it's an interesting topic. Movies that you definitely enjoyed or were going in a good direction that the ending either ruined or brought it down a little bit. Remember as always guys, please like and share this video, hit that subscribe button, and if you wanna join in on the fun with my patrons and being able to add ideas or possibly get your idea chosen for a Patreon pick, or even get to a tier to where you can choose reviews for me to do, Check out the link down below in the video description for my Patreon page. It's the best way to support this channel. Value you guys very much. Thank you so much for your continuing support. All you guys that threw in ideas this month. A lot of really good ones. And uh, I think we're going to have fun with this one. Also, this should go without saying, but I feel like I always need to put it out there as a PSA for those that haven't been paying attention. This is going to be a very spoiler-filled video. Whenever I'm talking about endings to movies, I will undoubtedly be spoiling most, if not all, of the conclusion of these films. So if you have not seen one of these movies, when you see the poster come up and you haven't seen it and you value that viewing experience and you don't want me to ruin it, please mute the video or skip to the next one or come back and watch this video after you've seen all these films, however you want to do it, but spoiler alert. So number 10, kicking this thing off, is going to be Scream 4. Now if you've seen my reviews, if you've seen my Scream ranking, you know that Scream 4 is actually pretty damn high on that list. It's actually my second favorite Scream film. And if it wasn't for the last 10 minutes or so of this movie, it has a very strong chance of being my number one. But that ending does hold it back for me pretty obviously from being that number one. You get through this whole reveal to where you have Jill and you have Culkin's reveal as being the other killer and the whole plot about wanting to be the new age version of Sydney and Randy and kind of recreating the scenarios of the first film. And then she kills Culkin, I can't remember his damn name, and this whole plot unveils to where Jill is going to win, and it was badass, it was crazy, it was awesome, where you're like, holy shit, she actually did what all the other killers could not do in this franchise, she won, she pulled it one over on Sydney, on Dewey, on Gale, and she's gonna walk away victorious to a certain extent. I almost feel like the movie should have ended there, and it would have been a ballsy, crazy way to either wait for another film, and have the recurring character come back as the killer or end the franchise there, kind of a down note. I don't know, I'm, I'm ballsy like that. But the way that they decide to follow it up with this whole hospital sequence to where Jill makes it to the hospital and Sydney doesn't quite fall victim to her wound, so she makes it to the hospital and then Jill hears about it, so she gets out of her hospital bed and goes and tries to kill Sydney in her bed as if people aren't going to put two and two together when Sydney is dead and she was just down the hall Suddenly Gale and Dewey are there, they figure it all out, now her plan's totally blown up, now all three of them are trying to kill her, and it just goes way off the rails for me, to the point where it was so ingenious and so smart, not only from a script standpoint, but from her character standpoint, this whole plot that she had, and it just totally unravels five minutes later in this hospital, and it just goes way too far into the stupid territory for me. Still entertaining enough. I love the line about don't fuck with the original, kind of playing on remakes, all of that. It's still, it doesn't kill the movie for me. Obviously, it's still my second favorite Scream film, but if they had just tweaked that ending or got rid of the hospital thing and just, you know, maybe just had Sydney open her eyes, or something to wrap this up in a different way, this might be my favorite Scream film. Number nine for me is gonna be Hancock. Now, this was a movie from like 10 years ago or something now to where it was this very ahead of its time idea about Will Smith playing this superhero who is basically a dick. He's a drunk, he doesn't really like helping people, people don't really value him. It's more of a grounded take on what if somebody came down with godlike powers, how the public would view him. And it's a very smart movie. And for the first half or so of the movie, 
it's awesome. It's hilarious. It's funny. His relationship with uh, Jason Bateman is great, and the way that he's kind of trying to boost the PR for him, and he's suddenly, you know, he's clean cut. He's got this little suit and everything, and he's kind of becoming the, the quintessential superhero. All that stuff is really fun and entertaining. As soon as you get into the storyline regarding Charlize Theron being his wife and being another superhuman, and even though this isn't the ending of the movie, I know I'm cheating a little bit, it's really just the, the way they decide to get to the ending of the movie. That's where the movie goes off the rails for me. Call me crazy one more time. Cuckoo. I'm still entertained by it. I still think it's a fun movie, but it just goes and reaches for way too much to have her as this character that, you know, by crazy little coincidences, they're brought back together. And then they have this whole fight across the city where they're beating each other up because he wants answers and everybody sees them. So it's like, okay, your life is over from now on because now they see that you're a superhuman too. You're not just gonna go back to sub the suburbs, lady. The whole thing about the closer they are together, they become mortal, it, it just doesn't work for me. The whole third act of the movie really just doesn't really work for me. It's a totally different movie. It feels like two different storylines, almost like you had a pitch idea for Hancock 1 and you had a pitch idea for Hancock 2 and somebody decided to push them together. That's kind of how the movie feels to me. Like I said, still entertaining. It's still a movie that for some aspects was ahead of its time, but if you did not have that Charlize Theron storyline and they had gone the more traditional route with him kind of just rising up to be the hero throughout the third act, I think this would have become a franchise, but it's not. It's just one of those Will Smith summer movies. Number eight is Passengers. This is a movie from a couple of years ago with Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence. They were kind of the big hot stars of the time, you know, to a degree they still are. And this was kind of their romance sci-fi adventure to, that to me almost feels like, I haven't done any research, it almost feels like this movie went through drastic studio interference or rewrites because there's some very dark aspects to this story to where you have Chris Pratt in this colony of hundreds of people that is going to this planet and they're in cryostasis and he mistakenly gets woken up and he's basically alone on the space station. He spends like the first year alone, just ready to kill himself because he's, he's isolated. He doesn't have anybody. And he eventually, through that isolation, kind of becomes obsessed with Jennifer Lawrence, wakes her up and they have this little budding romance that's built on a lie that she was mistakenly awakened to. By the third act of the film, she figures out that he's the one that woke her up and kind of damned her to be alone with him. And there's some creepiness there that I feel like a more interesting movie would have explored. Aurora, I don't want to lose you. I don't care! I don't care what you want! I don't care why you woke me up! You took my life! It would have gotten a little bit darker, maybe it would have went a little bit more into the thriller territory, but they stay the whole popcorn route, and the whole third act ending of this movie is about them kind of coming together to stop this supernova thing going on with the engines that's the reason that, you know, short-circuited Chris Pratt's little pod that somehow was contained for over a year without anything else happening, and they contain this, you know, CGI effect and then they become lovers again and then years later whenever everybody wakes up they see trees and they see all this shit that everybody that they had done for presumably the rest of their lives in this space station and even if you're gonna go that route I feel like the ending just misses punch because if they were there you would think that they probably would have had a child at some point and that child would have you know potentially woken up somebody else or, you know there's something there that felt like, aside from waking up and seeing trees and shit, there was something else the movie should have revealed or should have had another little, uh, some way to punch that theme towards the end about them kind of just embracing life together. The movie just kind of ends in a whimper. It's still an entertaining enough modern little sci-fi popcorn flick, but every single time that I rewatch it, I always kind of rewrite things into my head where I'm like, hmm, what if the third act, what if he got kind of psycho about the fact that she rejected him and then it was like a, a chase movie to where, she, you know, he's evil now and he's obsessed with her and there's these little ideas that I just feel like this concept is great. You just did the most vanilla thing with it. Number seven is going to be The Wolverine, the second solo film with Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. Now, I actually like this movie and can tolerate the way that it wraps up much more than most people. This would be much higher in my X-Men ranking than most viewers, I believe, but it's a movie that is awesome all the way up until the last 15 minutes or so to where 
It's a very grounded take on Wolverine. You know, he's in Japan, especially if you watch the rated R cut or the extended cut that you have on the Blu-ray, where there's this really bloody, you know, ninja fight towards the, the middle of the movie. There's a lot of things that explore his mortality where he's lost his powers and he's, he's dealing with things that he's never dealt with before, where he's hurt or he can't heal right away. It's a very cool exploration of that character. It has some really good action sequences with him fighting, you know, ninjas and samurais. And then you get to the end of the movie and suddenly he's fighting a Transformer. <laughs> he's fighting, there's this old Japanese guy that kind of drew him to Japan that he saved on, um, he saved from the, the atom bomb. And he turns out to be the villain at the end. He's got this little silver samurai mech suit and he's, you know, fighting Wolverine and drilling the adamantium and the healing power out of his claws. And it just, it gets so 2000s comic book generic shit by the end of it that you're kind of like, oh, you were on such a great run with this. This was such a grounded, cool take on the character and you just went full on what the fuck with it in the last 15 minutes. It's still entertaining enough. It still goes to that ending to where suddenly, you know, Magneto and Professor X are alive again. He's like, what the hell? And it gives you that great tease towards Days of Future Past. So I still really enjoy this movie. It's just a hiccup that you have to get through in the third act. But man, if they had stuck the landing with that, as amazing as Logan is, I mean, the Wolverine would be pretty high up there with that level of awesome, in my opinion, with a better ending. Number six is a little film called The Forgotten. Now this came out whenever I moved to Georgia. So I remember very well seeing the trailers for this and not getting the chance to go see it in theaters and finally getting the DVD. And it's a movie that has a really interesting premise, an interesting little sci-fi thriller premise to where Julianne Moore wakes up one day, her kid is gone and she's the only person that can remember him. The husband doesn't remember him, the neighbors, his friends, her friends, everybody's like, you don't have a kid, what are you talking about? Are you, are you mental? And it's this exploration of this mother's love for her kid and how far she's willing to go to uncover the fact that like, I know I have a kid, you are all screwing with me, something's going on. And it's this really cool premise that could have went in a lot of different directions. But the direction they chose was, aliens did it. You will find yourself. And it's so lame. It's such a facepalm moment when you're watching the movie and suddenly it's revealed, oh, aliens came down and they took her kid and they're just trying to explore and see if a mother's love can, can be vanquished by everybody telling her, no, you're crazy. And it's just, what? It, it's just like passengers. It's an idea that just feels like there's so many different ways you could go and they just went the weirdest, most generic route that they could. And unlike most of the movies on this list, this actually destroys this movie for me. This is one of the few movies on this list that I've never watched and will never watch or recommend because it just, totally dismantles anything that the movie had credibility-wise going for it. So it is that bad of an ending. Number five is gonna be the second time that Will Smith shows up on this list, and that is I Am Legend. Now this was a movie that, you know, kind of talking about remembering moving to Georgia, this was the first movie that I saw in theaters in Georgia that year. So this was something that I have very vivid memories of going to see and having a lot of excitement for, you know, this was at the height of Will Smith's career to where every summer he was the king of the blockbuster. It had a very cool premise to it. You know, they were kind of vampires, which totally drew me in. This whole concept of a movie that's just Will Smith. It's a movie that totally just hinges on his shoulders by himself and this dog. And he does a fantastic job with it. It's a very cool movie about, you know, post-apocalyptic and, you know, obsession and trying to find this cure and, isolation and this relationship that he buds with this dog goes to a very heartbreaking place towards the middle of the film and you know aside from some shoddy early you know 2000 cgi on the vampires or whatever you want to call them it's a very entertaining cool sci-fi thriller action movie then you get to the end of the film and the theatrical cut of this film has will smith grab a grenade and sacrifice himself to let this woman and this kid go Stop! <laughs> And it is such a disastrous ending for me. When you have a movie that hinges on how much we all love Will Smith and then you kill Will Smith kind of unceremoniously, you just destroyed the entire thing that you were building the success of this movie on. Luckily with this film, if you haven't been clued into this, there is an alternate or possibly an original ending to it on the Blu-ray to where it's a totally different ending. Throughout the movie, there's this theme of this butterfly where his little girl, one of the last things she said was, look at the butterfly, daddy. 
and it kind of has this theme throughout that society has gone on without Will Smith. This little vampire race is now society and he's kind of the monster among them because he's, he's so different and he's constantly trying to capture them and experiment on them to try to get this cure. And by the end of the film, this original ending has him to where he gives back this monster, this vampire that he's been experimenting on to the main villain uh, that's like his wife or his girlfriend. He kind of realizes that they're society now and he's his own thing. And then him and this girl and this, this woman go off together somewhere else to continue research, presumably. And there was even a short amount of time to where they were talking about doing a sequel to I Am Legend and using that ending as the canonical ending, which is really hard to do. And a lot of people saw the movie in the theaters and went, what the fuck, and never bought it. So there's a little light at the end of the tunnel with this one. Anytime I watch this, I do watch that original or alternate cut ending, but the theatrical ending, nope. Number four is gonna be a movie called Splice. Now, this is a very, frustrating movie for me because this movie came out everybody bashed it nobody really had anything nice to say about it and I finally watched it later on and I was about two-thirds of the way through the movie and I was like what movie did everybody else watch because this is pretty damn good as Adrian Brody and ah oh, what's the actress's name Dawn of the Dead chick Sarah Polly I almost said Sarah Paulson that would have been totally different but Sarah Polly and Adrian Brody are these um, biologists basically and they create this new species using some different DNAs for different uh, animals, and you have this creature that essentially is like their child, and through the entire movie they're raising it, and they're experimenting on it, and they're kind of becoming this weird little Frankenstein family, and it's just a very strange sci-fi film. And then it gets to the point where Adrian Brody kind of realizes through her eyes that Sarah Polly used her own DNA to create this because it's kind of having a likeness to her and eventually fucks the thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's such a weird scene because it's so dark and demented, but at the same time, you can't help but laugh, especially when Sarah Polly walks in and then Adrian Brody has to run after her. But from that point to the end, the movie just takes really weird turns to where the spliced creature has this spontaneous sex change out of nowhere to where it just kind of becomes a male and then becomes feral and tries to kill both of them and then impregnates Sarah Polly and there's this whole line where she's like, what do you want? And he's like, inside you. What? And it's frustrating as hell because I'm telling you, all the way up to that point, like two thirds of the way through the movie, it's a very interesting, cool, engaging sci-fi movie. And then it just goes way the fuck off the rails and goes into what the fuckville. And it just destroys the movie for me. This is another movie that I would be curious to rewatch it to see if knowing where things go by the end, if I would like it a little bit more. But I'm telling you, the way that the potential of this movie was, and you get to that ending in that third act and it just goes, now these top three, I gotta be honest, they're pretty close to each other for very different reasons. Uh, on a different day, number three might be in my number one and, and all of that. So number three for me is gonna be Law Abiding Citizen. Now this is a F. Gary Gray film where you got Jamie Foxx, you got Gerard Butler. Gerard Butler and his family are preyed upon at the beginning of this movie where they have burglars break in, they rape the wife, they kill the little girl, they kill the wife, they try to kill him, and he lives, and Jamie Foxx becomes his lawyer and essentially makes this deal to lessen the charges on the killer so that he can keep his conviction rate, so that they can get this dude convicted, he's out in like a year or whatever, and Gerard Butler says, fuck that. Comes back years later, he's taught himself law, and he basically has this whole mass murdering plot to teach Jamie Foxx a lesson and get revenge on him about you know, the value of life and the power that he has as a lawyer, and puts him through this game to where he has to go through all these things to try to save people, and it is a awesome movie. It is bloody as hell. Gerard Butler, it's probably my favorite role that he's ever did. I mean, that with, you know, Olympus Has Fallen is a great character too. It's very close, but it's just a fucking badass movie. It's gory. It goes into some very crazy ass places. It keeps you guessing. It's engaging. It's tense. And then you get to the ending. And while some people might be okay with this ending, to where Jamie Foxx gets one over on him and finally figures out the plot and tricks Gerard Butler into basically blowing himself up in the end, while they might get behind that because of the whole good triumphing over evil thing, and you know Gerard Butler morally at some point probably has to die, I get that, but the movie seriously fails at ever getting us as audience members back onto Jamie Foxx's side. From the beginning of the movie, 
you think he's a scumbag, you think he's a piece of shit. And the way that he interacts with Gerard Butler, it does nothing but increase that throughout the film. Even though he's the good guy, even though he's the innocent one, and Gerard Butler's murdering people, some of them innocent, you still side with him through the whole movie. You're like, yeah, I'm on his side. I, he shouldn't have probably killed the blonde chick, but you know, he, I get it. I get where he's coming from. Fuck those people. And the whole movie, you stay on that. And when you get to the end, and then Jamie Foxx triumphs over Gerard Butler, and he has to die, for me personally, the movie never gets you to switch to where you were on board for that ending. So to me, when you get to that whole reveal about Jamie Foxx pulling one over on him, I'm like, first of all, bullshit, because he's way too smart, and he would have thought of that ahead of time. Second of all, fuck you. I still don't like you. I don't want you to win. Kind of going back to what I was saying with Passengers about kind of rewriting things in my own demented little mind, I've always thought a cooler ending for this movie would have been to have the ending as it is, and the whole time, you know, Jamie Foxx is you know, trying to get to his daughter's violin recital. And that's where the movie ends. He gets there and he's kind of at, at peace with his wife watching his daughter, knowing that Gerard Butler's dead and this is all over with. I've always thought it would have been a demented, crazy little no. They probably would have divided audiences, <laughs> but if Gerard Butler, with foresight, had put some kind of an explosive into that violin, to where by the time his daughter got to the end at a recital and she hit a certain note, it just exploded and that was like this crazy little ending the movie would end on. I don't know. I don't know what that says about me. And you know, again, I'm a horror fan, so sometimes my mind just goes there, like this would be cooler. But uh, it's a movie that is just so awesome that when I get to that end, no matter how many times I rewatch this, because the rest of the movie is so great, it just never works for me. Number two is gonna be War of the Worlds, the Steven Spielberg version. Never seen the original. And I know this comes from a book, and I know that there is a set ending to this, so this is kind of you know, the, the thing that they signed up for when they did this movie or not. But it also goes back to that rule about not always adapting written material for the movies because it doesn't always work. You have this very badass sci-fi horror thriller to where aliens have come out of the ground in these huge gigantic machines and basically have started murdering people, mining people, and it's a survival film where you have Tom Cruise and his two kids on the run basically the entire film. This movie fails with its ending in a couple different ways. I mean, it's a very engaging movie. It's very creepy in spots. It's very exciting. The special effects are top notch. Not the best execution all the way through, but you're, you're enjoying the hell out of yourself. It's a damn good movie throughout the entire thing. You get to the end and you have this whole reveal about germs. Germs killed the aliens. Aliens start dropping, you know, the shields start going down, the fucking pods are starting to, you know, be like drunks. And they're like, what the hell is going on? And it kind of takes the whole victory of the movie away from humans and just puts it on this scientific thing where you get Morgan Freeman, you know, narration, oh, it was killed by the tiniest organisms on Earth. And I understand that that's where the H.G. Wells novel took things. I understand that's probably where the previous adaptations of this material took things, but it's a very anticlimactic way to go with a movie that's so larger than life with its action sequences and its explosions and its death and it just doesn't work for me. Then they reinforce that with this whole plot line with his son, with Justin Chatwin, to where the whole movie, this son is a dick. This is the type of son that seriously needs his ass whooped. Like, <laughs> I'm a firm believer in beating ass, and this is a kid that needs it. And the whole movie, he's just going against Tom Cruise. He's trying to, you know, do his own thing, not listen. And you get to this whole scene where there's warfare going on over this fucking hill, and people are dying, and he's like, I need to see this, Dad. I need it. And he's just like, like a drug addict. I gotta see it. Like a fucking moth of the flame. And Tom Cruise is trying to say, like, you're coming with me. You're not going over there. And then he has to choose, basically, to either stay fighting with him or go and save Dakota Fanning, his young daughter. And he lets his son go off so that he can save his daughter. Fine. Kind of a dark note, but the kid's fucking stupid and he deserves to get blown up over that hill because he's an idiot. And then you get to the end of the film and they've gone through hell and high water trying to get back to Tom Cruise's ex-wife. And he shows up and who walks out? His fucking son. And it's like this little, wrap it up in a nice little bow and you know, sprinkle confetti on it type of ending where everybody lives and it just does not work. It's like bullshit, that fucking kid did not survive. He did not get through that encounter and then by all, you know, against all odds, make it all the way back home without any help from his father or anybody else. It just, it totally stretches plausibility. It asks you to believe way too much by the end of it. And because you don't even like the kid, you're like, Fuck him, I don't care. But number one, good movies destroyed by their endings. Hi, Lindsay. High Tension. Now this is a movie that is highly, highly debated. High Tension is what you get whenever you discuss the ending of this fucking movie. 
You have one end of the camp that sees this movie and gets to the end and you know connects all the dots and says, okay, this totally works for me. This makes perfect sense and I can go on with this journey. It doesn't stretch my believability and this movie is still great. Then you have the other side of the camp that I am firmly placed my ass in where you get to the end of the movie and you go, bull shit. This whole movie is like this slasher extravaganza where this random truck driver who's introduced to us by giving himself head with a severed fucking head and then throws the head aside. That's like how demented this dude is and how dark this movie is. And it's like, oh, this guy is a fucking villain. And the whole movie, he is basically just obliterating anybody he gets his hands on trying to chase down these two girls. You get to the third act and there's this reveal that the main character is actually the killer. And the truck driver killer that we've been seeing this entire time is just a manifestation in her head to where she's killing everybody that in her mind gets between her and the other character that they're trying to save because she has this lesbian fan, uh, fantasy with them being a couple together. And by the end of the movie, you're like, wait, what? And then you go back and you start going over scenes in the movie to where there's car chases that don't make sense now because this doesn't fucking exist. And you know, the, the, there's a kill where the dude is so huge, like he shoves a you know, chest of drawers against a dude's face and it like decapitates half of his head. And you're like, okay, this chick's like 60 pounds. That's not happening. It asks so much of the viewer to where you just have to either make logical sense and say, okay, this entire movie did not exist up to this point then. And she was just like maybe stabbing dudes and then just thinking that she was decapitating people in car chases. And I just, whatever way you decide to do that, either you can't buy it and the ending doesn't work and destroys the movie, or you can try to make sense of it, but then I can't stand movies where everything was a dream. So I fucking despise the end of this movie. I was like, what the hell? When I first saw it and I was reviewing it for a patron request, I got to the end and I went, what the fuck? You had me all the way up to this point. This was brutal, this was crazy, and then you throw that in there? No! Alexander, aha, uh-huh. no! Again, if you can make sense of the movie, I, I'm not trying to open that argument again down below. I had enough of it when I did my review. If you like it, if it works for you, awesome. I'm glad that you can secure that movie experience all the way through to the credits. Just respect the fact that I can't, I guess. Number one for me, high tension. <laughs> So that's it guys for this month's Patreon pick of top 10 good movies with bad endings. What are some of yours? Do you agree with this list? Are there movies that I missed? Are there movies on here that you didn't think were good until the ending anyway? Let me know down below all of your thoughts. Keep the high tension to a dull roar, please. And uh, let me know all your thoughts, guys. We'll discuss it down below. Please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed this. Want to check out some more of my rankings or reviews. I got a whole slew of them on this channel, so you will be pleased. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.